when we're trying to do behavior change, we begin to adjust. And maybe like we really get into reading and so we start a book and now we're like, oh my, this book is so good. I want right. to keep reading. But you have to read for 10 minutes before you realize how much you love the book. You can have a virtuous cycle or an unvirtuous cycle. So I was thinking about your book because I was just I was just doing something up in my office. I was thinking about, have you seen the movie Gladiator? No. You've not seen the movie Gladiator. Talk, I mean, it's one of the greatest movies of all time. I'll, um, I'll watch you it. You should. There's a scene in the beginning of Gladiator where Maximus, this is Russell Crowe's character, is just standing there. And it looks like this beautiful scene. And he's just sort of standing there and the wind is like ruffling through his fur collar and he's dragging his hands through this field of wheat. Then this bird lands and uh, he's watching the bird and the steam is kind of coming off the ground behind him. And then the bird takes off and he follows it with his eyes and he smiles. And you're like, where is this beautiful heavenly place? Well, okay, and, it's and then it zooms out and he's on the front with the Roman army and they're mm -hmm. about to engage in this ferocious, terrible, uh, cataclysmic yeah. battle. And I was thinking about it because to me, this is a very stoic idea, which is that like, we can see whatever we want to see, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And the lens which we look at the world or the senses that we perceive the world determine whether we're in a beautiful, lush landscape yes. or a depressing yes. hellscape. No, exactly. Or we we think we're in a sterile gray box, but in fact, we're, but we're in the beach, but we're in yes. the sterile gray box in our head. Yes. Yeah, the cubicle that you carry in your pocket um, can oh, be, beautiful. yeah. Or not yeah. beautiful, the opposite of beautiful. Right, but yeah, it's like, how do you, so how do you get into the world? Yeah. Yeah, what's the Milton mind? Like we can, a man can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. Yeah. It's all about how we perceive things Yeah, to a certain degree. Yeah, and we perceive things very, very differently. Well, yeah, that was one of my favorite things in the book. You're, you talk about some optical illusions mm -hmm. and then also just things like that drugs. you've seen thousands of times in your life but it's not until someone points it out or you decide to look at it consciously that you miss what's been happening the entire time. Like the FedEx yes. logo. Or no, you you talk about the Baskin Robbins logo. Yeah. It also says 31 in the middle. Yeah. yeah. And the Hershey's Kiss one. Yeah, Tostitos. What's Amazon. the Tostitos one? It, if you look at it very clearly, it's like two people like around a, uh, a, like a bowl of chips going like this. Really? That's the two T's, yeah. What's the one, what's the version of that where like you, I was just thinking about this, like I was trying to remember this song lyric and so I was writing it, like searching all these different phrases, trying to sing it in my head and then I realized I, I couldn't find it because like I, I, I thought the person was saying tired of life, but they were saying tired of lying. Uh-huh. And it totally changes the meaning, obviously. Yes. And now I can't go back to hear the song that struck me in a certain way. But like, it's not just visually that we do yeah. this, it's with all yes. our senses. Yeah, no, absolutely. I can't hear sirens because I live in New York City. Yes. So they just fade out. You can't smell your home the way a guest smells it. Right. Because like to me, this bookstore has a very distinctive smell. Sure. But you probably don't even smell it because it's so familiar to you, your brain doesn't uh, alert you to it. Yeah, isn't there a commercial that talks about nose blindness? Yeah, exactly. Yes. It's a real thing. You can't smell the air freshener. You can't smell the cats. I'm like, does my apartment smell like dog food? Because I don't. I wouldn't know if I go yeah. away for a month. Then I could smell it. But yeah, of all the chapters of the book, that's the one that I related to the least in the sense that I have a terrible sense of smell. Like you know, during COVID, when people are like, you know, if you lose your sense of smell, like be worried. Yeah, and I'm like, how would I notice? Like, really? I, yeah, I had. Um, I had like a septum surgery on my nose like twice because I mm. s screwed it up. And I think they messed, I don't remember oh. ever having a strong sense of smell, but I think they messed it up when I had, like when they messed with my nose. Can you smell anything? I can smell like really bad smells or uh -huh. like, I guess I can, I think I can smell some new smells, but I, I tend, I don't, I wouldn't say I have a strong sense okay. of smell. So uh, people will remark on smells that you have not noticed. Yes. And, and ones that you don't, you can't smell even when they remark on them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So people are like, oh, smell that cherry blossom tree. You're like, I don't smell anything. Yes. Or okay. when someone is like describing, you know, those yeah. and I'll be like, I mean, I smell something, but that's right. not like you're, it's like you're just, you're describing something as a musician mm -hmm. and me not being familiar with notes. Right. I have no idea the language that you're speaking. What's well, interesting, I have a neglected sense quiz. What's your neglected sense yeah. that people can take? Um but that is like for people who have access to a, a sense, but they're just not that interested in. Like sure. I'm not, mine is taste. Like yes. I taste fine, but I'm just not that interested in taste. Yes. But you have something where like you may be neglecting it because you actually don't 
have the same access to perception that other people might be having with their nose. Well, it's probably a feedback loop where like, because it's not strong, the muscle atrophies or the, the your, your control of the thing is less and you don't. Or your just, interest in it. Yeah. yeah. Like Dude. I'm very interested in smell. So I explore, yes. it's an appreciated sense. But yeah. For, but for me, taste is not, I had to really do a lot of things, which was super fun because I had all this low hanging fruit because I had not really done much to explore my sense of taste. But for some people, I mean, they even watch TV shows about, I'm like, right. why would that, yes. like, why are you watch a TV show about taste? But, you know, people love it because they're really interested in it. They want to explore it. They want to learn. They want recommendations. That's what you do with your appreciated sense. Did you just have an underdeveloped palate or it just, you're like, have a sensitive palate? What was it for you on taste? Or you're just, just not into it? I don't get that into it. I had a super strong uh, sweet tooth, so I gave up sugar like 12 years yes. ago just because I was so boring right. to manage uh, sugar. And uh, But I think one of the reasons that it was int- pretty easy for me to quit sugar was that I just am not that into taste. Right. So it didn't feel like a big loss. felt only like a gain. And and then probably neg- like deliberately neglecting it, like the high notes of taste— Sugar is, I think, the ultimate high yeah. note of taste. Yeah. Yeah. It probably it's like intoxicating because yes. it's actually toxic. Um, yes. Uh, well, it very much limited my range for sure. But I like I enjoy food more actually now because yeah. I think you taste you t- like to me something like blueberries taste very very sweet and delicious because you know they're a little bit sweet. I loved that in the book you were. I love whenever someone brings something up and you're like, I haven't thought of that that way or I haven't, I don't know, right? Mm-hmm, right. And you talked about um, what the inside of a blueberry looks like. I know, yes. right? You know, I mean, I have no idea. <laughs> I only know because my kids are still young, so there's a lot of like smashed fruit Yeah. Okay, house. right, right, right. Underfoot, you're yes. like just getting them up with the sponge, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Although we just, we just took them yesterday. Um, this is my favorite time of year in Texas because there's wild blackberries mm-hmm. all over. And so... We were, you know, just walking through these fields, picking these wild blackberries, and you know, you're noticing like, okay, is that you? You're starting to notice from the feel and the look and the color which one is going to be delicious, which mm-hmm. one is going to yeah. be is not quite ripe. And this is just a, it's like a spectrum that previously was totally compressed to you, mm-hmm. like right. it didn't exist or it existed only as the final product to you. But the idea that there was gradients along mm-hmm. the perception. Right. Because it's out of sight, out of mind, so you're just not considering it. And then there's something explosive and wonderful about when you suddenly become aware of right. a spectrum of sound or taste, mm-hmm. or and then you're like, I'm going to really get into that. Right. Well, the thing about the brain is the brain is a difference detector. So it's looking for uh, danger and opportunity. Yes. And when it's when information is valuable, then it will start to like really, really pick up on those nuances. And yes. so then as it, you become attuned to it and it matters, then you start picking that up. But if you're just like, I'm wandering through a grocery store, just like grabbing a bag and they're all basically the same. Yes then they all just look alike because you don't need well, to. And they're, they're, there's something fundamentally unnatural about those, right? Mm-hmm. So like uh, the world of the grocery store, the world of the, the hardware store, it's filled with straight lines and manufactured things and mass produced things. All the, the, um, the, the blackberries in the store, let's say, first off, the they grow them a certain way maybe they're genetically modified in some way they all get equal amounts of water Mm -hmm. and sunlight and then as they're picking them they're getting rid of all the bad ones Mm -hmm. right so you get this thing of artificial uh unrealistic sameness Mm -hmm. but then when you're out in the world if you're looking for it you know there's the bad ones there's the ones that were eaten by a caterpillar there's the smashed ones there's the the one in the shade yes um well uh I just forgot my. I was going to say something about blueberries. Anyway, yeah, um, it's interesting. Uh, oh God, what was I going to say? Anyway, something the about sameness. Blue- We're talking about sameness of things. Oh yes. Yeah. Um, the thing about uh, sight is that because because of the way the human brain is wired, we have more real estate in the brain that is devoted to sight. Sure. And usually, when there is a conflict among senses, sight will trump. Mm. And so one of the ways that you see that, and I'm not a lover of tomatoes, yeah. but people who love tomatoes are like, well, now tomatoes are very bland and tough because they've been bred to look good and to sure. pack well yes. and to look uniform and bright and round. Um, and so they've sacrificed taste to to, uh, to sight. Same thing with flowers. Like I love smell. And so I love 
hyacinths, roses, lilacs, things that have a beautiful, beautiful smell, but often they have been bred for longevity, resistance to insects, um, and beauty, which is great, but I love the smell. And so there's right. been that trumping. You know what else is interesting too, talking about like seeing things? Like how often do people notice that this there was also intentionality mm -hmm. designed into the thing? Because you never take the cover off and you right. never think about all well, the other a things. A lot of people do, some people do different readers, but you're right. You don't necessarily explore it. Well, it's like you have you to look, you have to, I think to me, that's kind of the essence of the book is that like, right. There's exactly. a, a whole bunch of stuff that you don't look for. Yes. But it's there. Well, this is like ketchup because ketchup is ubiquitous. 97% sure. of Americans have it in their fridge. We, we think of it as being just kind of like this throwaway thing. And sure. yet it's the secret ingredient of so many foods. And it's like a, you know, ketchup is magic because it has all five of the basic tastes. Yes. Sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. That's really hard for a, for something to do. So it's incredibly sophisticated and complex. And when you really taste it, you it's like an explosion in your mouth and there's an aftertaste and there's the texture and you realize like why it's so popular. But it's very easy to just take it for granted. Yeah, speaking of taste, what's uh, someone was telling me like uh, the reason you didn't like Brussels sprouts when you were a kid is that Brussels spr sprouts now taste different. So the opposite of the tomato thing mm. you were talking about, which is that tomatoes are bred for appearances, which may negatively correlate to what people actually like to taste. Mm -hmm. uh, Brussels sprouts, they basically realized that people hated them for pretty good reason. Mm -hmm. And then they they bred them to actually taste better. Oh, interesting. And then, Less bitter. Yes. And people, for whatever reason, decided to get good at cooking them. Mm -hmm. And they don't just serve boiled Brussels sprouts anymore. Right. There's a bunch of like amazing ways to do it. But fundamentally, the Brussels sprout is still a Brussels sprout. And uh, by looking at it differently, working on it differently, it becomes transformatively different. But, well, and a lot of things have bred to be, become sweeter. So apples are sweeter, grapes are sweeter. So it, may, it would make sense that they've just bred, bred Brussels sprouts to be less bitter because that's pr the objection to them is that, they're, is that they're bitter. Have you had cotton candy grapes? Yes. How good are those? I mean, well, see, but I don't eat sugar. And so I wouldn't eat something like so you a don't cotton candy. you don't even eat things that have natural sugar in them? Uh, I sometimes will eat berries, but usually not. Interesting. No, I don't eat things like watermelon or, yeah, I typically wouldn't eat grapes. Wow. Right. That's sad. It's kind of a hobby, I have to say. <laughs> Not Everybody eating needs sugar a hobby. Is a hobby. Like, yeah, it's kind of fun. I like, I'm like, I'm just gonna go hard into this. Um, yeah, I really don't eat carbs. So there's a lot of things I don't eat. Yeah. Wow. Flour, you rice. Eat? You know, eat anything that's that is not carbs. That's there's a whole big huge do you world eat meat? of delicious food. I do eat meat. Okay. I eat meat, I eat fish, I eat eggs, I eat so many eggs. I eat a ton of nuts. It's like so many it's like a squirrel nest in my house. We have so many nuts. <sighs> I think that one and of the things of I take from optical illusions, which I think mm -hmm. is an important also stoic concept, which is this idea that like, yes, your mind is your friend. Yes, your mind is this uh, powerful thing, but your mind is also not your friend. Yes. And your mind is fucking with you. And what you think, what you would swear on your life yes. is presenting to you as X could very obviously not be X. Yes. No, and that's very true with our senses because very often we we think we're perceiving something, but maybe it's because of context or it's the lighting or it's yeah. our own. Um, you know, you see this people have conflicts because it's like you're complaining. Oh, I don't like this. It's like I don't like I don't like this music playing, and you're like, yeah. oh no, it's like it's great for creativity if we yeah. have jazz playing in our yeah. open office plan. And mm -hmm. it's like, no, people are very different. They have very different experiences, and they bring different things to their environments, and they take different. So sometimes it's show more compassion for yourself if something's mm -hmm. bugging you that other people are fine with, or maybe you need to realize that people may be complaining about something you think is fine but other people find very distracting or, or annoying. Yeah, it's always weird. Like if you say you don't like something, people are like, oh, it's an acquired taste. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense to me. And then there's also something strange about the logic of like, no, you have to in, endure how not good it is for a while. And then either it becomes tolerable mm -hmm. or it becomes good. Um, why, like, let's say alcohol or something. Mm -hmm. Why are you acquiring said or coffee. taste? Yes. Yeah, right. Yes. Well, I mean, I think that's a big tension because we love 
novelty. We're drawn mm-hmm. to novelty, but we also per, like, in a way we prefer familiarity because yeah. it's easier. And so it's sort of like, well, maybe I could make myself like this. Like yes. with music, I was always like my way of, I, you know, I don't really like music. Other people like it so much more. I have like this cramped vision. What does this mean about me? I'm a killjoy. Um, and I'm like, what? and I kept thinking like, if I just listened more and more and more, right. but then I'm like, maybe I shouldn't try to listen more and more. Maybe I should do the things I already enjoy and not right. try to develop a taste for it. But then I also realized that I do like particular songs and I could just enjoy music that way. I was a song lover, not kind of a general music lover. Right. But I was thinking, could I kind of force myself to acquire a taste just through f- sheer familiarity? And I think there is something like, if you drink coffee enough time, yes. you might acquire well, it's like, a taste Why are it. you acquiring the taste? Are you yeah. acquiring the taste because you actually do want to explore? You, right. you feel like expanding your palate gives you mm-hmm. this whole other way of perceiving reality that's probably positive. Are you acquiring the taste because you want to get wasted on the yeah, other yeah, side yeah, of taste? Yeah, yeah. Or or because people in your social class or group are making you feel right. weird for not liking that thing. Right. That's probably the right. worst Pure reason pressure. to acquire right. a taste. Okay, so here's an idea that's like one of my central mantras for myself. And tell me if this is a stoic okay. idea. I want to accept myself and also expect more from myself. Yes, sure. The tension... Uh, the tension of uh, unconditionally supporting yourself as you are as a flawed, imperfect person, Mm -hmm. and then also questioning how fixed some of those imperfections Mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. And whether you could raise your aspirations for yourself. Yeah. Well, do you know the Stockdale Paradox? I, okay, remind me so what it's, that is. It's, it's in Good to Great, but it comes from James Stockdale, the prisoner of war, who gets it from Stoicism. He's basically, Jim Collins asked him, like, who ha- asks him who has the most trouble in oh, the prisoner of yes. war camp? Yes, it's this I exact do know this tension, one. The right. tension yeah, between yes. acceptance yes. And, and sort of indomitable you know, determinants. Right, d- right. Determination. Right, right. Yes. Do you hope for the best or do you like resign yourself to like the moment? Yeah. I think a lot of times there are these tensions yeah. within. Um, because both are true. Yes. You know, the opposite of a profound truth is also true. And yes. so there are these things where kind of our great challenge is to figure out how to think about it in a particular context. Yeah. Well, I feel like in philosophy and some religious traditions, a lot of what people say are contradictions or yes. paradoxes are really just a reflection of the fact that reality is complicated. Yes. And sometimes you have to do yeah. X and sometimes you have to do the opposite of X. Well, and a great example of this, and again, Stoic or stoic or not, this yeah. is like the game we'll play sure. next time. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes people say, "Well, you have to you have to appreciate the moment, live in the moment. The moment is all we have." That's yeah. true. But a life that has no, that takes no consideration for the future is not a good life. And a life where you don't reflect on the past is also not a, a good life. And so it's like, how do we think about the present, the future, and the past in the right way? Because they're there's it's sort of they all have to be weighed against each other. Well, the one I think. That- about the most is like sometimes the solution to a problem or an obstacle or a situation is to zoom way in, yeah. to look at it super close, yes. just the immediate thing in front of you. And sometimes you have to zoom way yes. out and yeah. see it from a distance, see yes. it you know, in light of what's happened before and what will happen after. And you might need to do one, one minute, yeah. and literally the next minute and the next situation do the exact opposite of what was just supposed to be this universal problem-solving technique. Right. Well, and for Life in Five Senses, one of the exercises that I did, maybe my most ambitious exercise, was to visit the Metropolitan Museum every day. The daily practice the, that you yeah. talk about. Um, because I just was really interested to see how that experience would change over time if I with so much familiarity. And one of the things, and, and I didn't really know what to expect, but the, one of the big things that came from it is exactly what you're saying, which is I got such a sense of perspective. It's such a vast place. It's such a timeless place. My own petty grievances and petty yeah. preoccupations is just put into this, this, this thousands of years of human endeavor, and uh, it just it just was so refreshing. It got me out of my head, and um, it just gave me a relief um, because I was just part of something that was so eternal and so transcendent. And how much of those daily visits was you? managing to cram in what was more than a person could possibly do in a single day. Mm. There's so much stuff. And how much of it was you looking at the same things day after day? Well, that's the beautiful thing about doing something every day is no one time matters. Like this need to like make the most of it or be productive Mm -hmm. or like, you know, see as much as you can. 
doesn't matter. I'm only right. coming back tomorrow. I'm coming back. You know, I still go every day. Like sure. that year is long over. Um, so it would just depend on what I felt like. And I, I have a very disciplined mind. I'm very, very disciplined. And so for me, it was kind of recess. So I really wanted to keep away from having, trying to discipline my mind or like have an approach that I had sure. to stick to. So it was very much sometimes it'd be long, sometimes it'd be short. Sometimes I do things like it's President's Day. Let me go look at all the presidents I could find. Kind right. of like fun little tasks. Um, sometimes I just go look at one thing. Sometimes I just sort of wander around and experience the museum as kind of a setting, yeah. and not even really look at anything in particular. So it just changed day to day what I felt like I wanted to bring to you know what I was in the mood for. Really, there is a stoic idea that we never step in the same river twice. Well, a hundred percent. How much of it yeah. would have been that for you? Yeah. It's like you're this. No. Yeah. The, the art is the same, but you're different. Well, the one thing that I found is the art is changing much more than I thought. Even yeah. like there's new exhibits and right. like they're doing renovations, but they swap the paintings in and out much more, like with no fanfare. I'm like, nobody notices this except for me because right. I'm literally coming every sure. day. But yeah, it, it was, but who knew that? I did not know that. Um, so it was, it was fascinating. Somebody that a lot of people have this urge to do something day after day yeah. because it, you see things unfold differently. Somebody told me that he goes to his same, his same like chain drugstore every day. And I'm like, there's so much going on in a big chain drugstore. I would absolutely go every day. That, yes. that sounds so fascinating to me. Like to watch a time lapse of that drugstore uh, would be incredible. Like, how is it different? How does it change through the seasons? How does it respond to trends? What are the people doing? How are they behaving? How are they dressing? Oh, now we've got self-checkout. What's yeah. happening? How are people? I mean, there's a lot going on. Well, also just to think like, okay, so the night before you go to the drugstore, like you go in the morning, that night, some crazy person could have come in and knocked everything off to the yeah. shelf. It could have yeah. been this huge event that yeah. it's like an event that the people who witnessed it will remember forever. It was a giant pain in their yeah. ass. They had to do a ton of overtime yeah. to fix it. The police came. Yeah, yeah. it was like one of those things. Yeah. You're like, yeah, it was in the you know, paper. <laughs> yeah, like the morning, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the night crew is buzzing yeah. to the morning yeah, crew. Yeah. You'd never guess yeah. what happened. But then you as the customer yeah. come in at 1130 and there's not a single trace that this happened. No. You have Every paper towel idea. roll yeah. is, yeah. No, it's really interesting. But then you would pick up all these subtle differences. Like, Probably. oh, these two people are like, these two, um, you know, people are having a fight. And like, sure. this person's on the on the, on the um, audio system all the time. Somebody's messing with the There's playlist. There's more security than normal. Yeah, or, um, you know, the seasonal changes. But anyway, I, so, but when I, when I did it, I thought this was very idiosyncratic. But it turns out a lot of people, like, they'll take exactly the same walk with their dog. Yeah. Or if they're like forest bathing, they'll go to the same sit spot. I think for I think some people really thrive on novelty and they would never try to chain themselves to doing the same thing every day but for some people it's very appealing and there and I have to say that if it's the kind of thing that is attractive to you I was it, it only becomes more interesting the longer I do it it's not like I'm like wearing it out and now it's boring it's like now I want to go to the Met every day for the rest of my life because it's right. so rich and it only becomes more rich I feel a tension with that with reading because there's so many books that oh, I want to read. But rereading is so and great. reading is amazing, yes. I absolutely agree with that. And I love to reread, so I have to fight the impulse to just reread. Yeah. In fact, I'm having the summer of rereading. What this, are you rereading? Uh, I'm reading um, The Varieties of Religious Experience by William James, mm -hmm. Crowds in Power by Elias Kennedy, The Life of Samuel Johnson by James Boswell. Have you read The Club? By, uh, about Samuel Johnson and Boswell? Oh, no, I have not. I had forgotten about that book. I should, is it really good? I just, I read it a couple months ago and I just finished doing my notes on it and oh. I found it absolutely incredible. Oh, 100%, that's yes. great. I'll read it in advance yes. to prep up. Um, I love Samuel Johnson. He's one of my favorite writers. Mm -hmm. uh, well, anybody interested in human nature, of course is interested sure. in Samuel Johnson because he's so, he can say in one sentence what people write entire like PhD yes. theses on. Um, uh, and then there's one other, oh, and then, uh, well, I was going to reread Andy Warhol, but I think, uh, I think I'm going to like He's go on a totally, book, right? uh, yes, yeah. I, I'm love, love, love Andy Warhol. But so I think I'm going to do a whole thing about Andy Warhol. So he won't be my summer of rereading. He'll be some other little reading task. Yeah. There, especially if you're someone who takes notes in books. Yes. Um, I do, uh, so usually I'll reread the old copy that I have. Yes. And you notice what you notice. Yes. But then sometimes- That's so valuable. I've been re I've been like, no, I'm gonna read a fresh, because I have this bookstore, I'll just take a new one off the shelf Ooh. and I'll go, I wanna, I just wanna experience it closer to the first time. Interesting. And then do you compare? Yeah, I'll notice, oh, I took way more notes the first time than the second time yeah. or- um, You just pick, you're, because it's a different river. Yes. 
Yes. Yeah. So, yes. So, oh, it's it's the same river, but a slightly different right, river. Right, because you're different. It's like a different. photograph of the river or something. Yeah, well, and there's some authors who are famous for being different every time you read them. Like Tolstoy is famous mm -hmm. that way, that it's different every single time you read it. Have I you feel read, like Virginia um, Woolf is that way. Have you read his book, A Calendar of Wisdom? Oh, yeah, yeah. That one, is, like, so I read a page of that most the thing mornings. thing is, Tolstoy is such a horrible person that I, yes. if you love reading Tolstoy, do not read any biography of him. <laughs> like, don't, just don't do it. But, because then you will love his fiction. But that's it, a great example. So you read the book and you have one sense of it and then you read about the man and mm -hmm. then it's impossible for you to have the same sense of... Yeah. I'm just trying to forget it as yes. fast as I can so I can go back and love it as much as I do. I know, that is that is the tension. Well, art, the art of monstrous men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. Oh, no, I love Calendar of Wisdom. It's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And not that many people know about it. Well, the, And then the other thing is like, I've tried to find some of the quotes... No, he's very fast and loose. You, yes. Yeah, I think some of them he just made up. And that also changes how I, now I go, right. did he, but, so and so, like, because he quotes the Stokes a lot. So I'll be like, where is that at Epic Tease? Yeah. Did I miss it? And in some cases I missed it. And in other times, this is a paraphrasing of a paraphrase. Right. No, I have had exactly the same problem. And then it's the problem of translations because sure. these, some of these are, you know, a different translation will get you to a very different place. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, you will have your favorite translation. Um, but yeah, with some of Tolstoy, I'm like, I don't, I could never, I couldn't find it. And, yeah. and, and so he's somehow either like paraphrased it, as you say, beyond re recognition, or he just was sloppy. Reading different translations is also a really great way to drill down on stuff. So you read, you know, a translation of the Odyssey from the seventies yeah. and then Emily Wilson's new translation. And you're like, oh, wow, this is, you, you realize one, how much a translation is a reflection of the time mm -hmm. that the author yes. is reading in uh, or writing in, and then also how much discretion the translator has yes. over what is presented and how it's presented. Well, because I always have, like, have a dedicated summer of reading something. So I had the summer of Proust a couple summers ago, and I have a lot of friends um, who are you know big Proust um, yeah. enthusiasts. And so I said to them, well, okay, well, which translation should I, re or should I read? And I mean, it was this like warfare, you know, <laughs> yeah, because yeah. they had such sure. strong views. So I ended up reading like the most classic one because that's the one I wanted. But but they, but people were saying it's just, it's really very, very different when you read a different translation. I usually say just, just don't read whatever one is free on the internet. Yeah. Because it's free for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> you get what you pay for. Yeah. 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 That's true. It's, yeah. that's it's a good old rule. enough. That's it's old good. enough that no one is even bothering to try to maintain the copyright. Right. <laughs> like, there's something to that. But a great way to see this sort of in brief is the Delphic Oracle. Like I love like the Delphic maxims. Sure. And if you no, compare, yeah, yeah, if you compare them, they're really, they're different in very significant ways. And so I've thought, can you mix in, like if I had my mm. own list, like here they are, or here are my favorites, can I mix and match translations or is that not legit? What, are what your do you favorites? think? I don't even know. Like I have to go through yeah. and be like, okay, well, wh which one? But, you know, there's there. Some of them are kind of strange. I'll give you one favorite, but first, I think that's a feature, not a bug, of the oracle, right? Even in the own, in even when the oracle was saying yeah, it, and yeah. it, there was yeah. no debate over yeah. right. what it was because everyone yeah. spoke the same right. dialect of it was Greek. Greek. Yeah, it was supposed to be just vague enough that yeah. you would perceive what you needed to perceive. Well, one of them is something like perceive what you have known or something yeah. very Yoda, yeah. Or or it's um uh, the the famous one with um, Themistocles was like, uh, go to your wooden wall. Oh, right. And yeah. he's like, that means boats, you know, or right. what, like, and you're like, okay, that's right. cause you're a naval captain right. and you already wanted to do a naval strategy yeah. or whatever. But you realize that oh. the, the purpose of it was to be just deliberately vague enough that smart people could use it as kind of a way to describe or to yeah. to put support behind what they already wanted to do. But my favorite is from Zeno, the founder of Stoicism. So as a young man, he's this part of this merchant family. So he travels all over and he's, he decides one time to stop at the Delphi to get um, to get uh, like advice on his yeah. life. And they say they say to him, "You will become wise when you begin to have conversations with the dead," which he's like. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. You know, and and I think also part of it was it was meant to be something that you chew on, like mm -hmm. those right. Zen yeah, things. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, just yeah. sit there and yeah. think about Cohen. it. Yes, yeah. and so he Every tradition he has thinks these. about it for many many years, and then he suffers this shipwreck, and he washes up in Athens, and he loses everything. He's penniless, and he walks into a bookstore. Um, that's why this <laughs> bookstore is called the Painted Porch because he, he walks into this bookstore, which he then founds. A Greek walks into a, <laughs> yeah, walks uh, into a the bookstore. Yeah. Um, but anyways, he's in this bookstore 
And that's when he realizes, because he, he, the, the owner of the bookstore is, is reading something from Socrates or something, he's, and he realizes that Conversations with the Dead is oh, books. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh. That's what they are. But this is the thing is you make your own oracle. That's the, that's the, that's the, the genius of it. It's yes. like the placebo. Your brain is the painkiller. Your, your mind, your imagination. Like you are the oracle. Well, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. 100%. The me, the, when you need the meaning of the thing, mm -hmm. then it unlocks itself, whereas before it was gibberish. Well, a project that I have had on the back burner for a long time is this one. It's called like Scientific Oracle. I yeah. don't know what I'm going to call it because okay. I want to create, create a system of uh, like oracular prediction. Yes. Uh, myself. Because I'm so intrigued by this because you can't, it's our minds that create that meaning. And so what would, what would the prompts be? And I, what would be like the symbolic, anyway. It's have like you a read the Rick thing. Rubin book? Um, I the just, oh, I was, um, I just uh, uh, have it on my, the top of my library list and it hasn't, you know, it's the, of course it was checked out. I'm really excited <laughs> well, to read it. Well, I got it. one behind you, I'll give it to okay, you. Okay, but good. He, he talks about this in the book. So he's like, when artists are stuck, he gives them two pieces of advice. Like, let's say they're stuck lyrically. Um, he, what's the, what's the Buddhist thing? It's like the mandala. No, no, no. The Buddhist thing where it's like random numbers and it like unlocks stuff for you. It just like tells you what to do. Um, a Cohen. No, no, no. It's, it's, uh, it's this Buddhist thing where it's basically like oh, doubt it. Uh, the, um, Te Ching. Yes. The, yeah. yeah. You like, the, it's like, yeah. It, yeah, yeah, it yeah, right, just, right now. It gives you these set six, of instructions. Yeah, you throw, you cast. Um, yes. Yeah. So he's like, just, just. He's basically saying, hand over yes. control to yes. someone other yes. than yourself. No, I'm. Yes, I'm very preoccupied with that. And yeah. he tells, uh, not in the book, but the the famous example of him doing this is the band System of a Down. Their mm -hmm. big song, Chop Suey. It has this, um, this really haunting sort of bridge. What is he saying in the bridge, like? Why hast thou forsaken me? He just like sings this over and over again. And it's like haunting and dark and amazing. The song was a huge hit. Um, the story was they didn't know what they wanted the bridge to say. And Rick Rubin told them to go to the shelf, take a book off of the shelf. So they took the Bible, And, and just obviously. pick a random line yeah. and that is it. So the idea uh, of like handing over yes, control to yes. something other than yourself, that's what the Delphi was also. Well, so in the book, I write about how, like I had this list of um, what I was calling indirect directions that were just like these kind of gnomic, like break the frame, rearrange yeah. the parts, you know, uh, uh, just dozens of those. But I didn't like the fact that it was in my computer because it felt very ghost-like. Yeah. And also I was like, I'm just gonna, for I create so much stuff. I'm like, I'm just gonna forget I even have this one yeah. day and I'll just vanish. So I, I, and I found my father's old Rolodex and I was so enchanted by it. I bought a Rolodex and wrote all these things. Just, uh, yeah, so I can just pull them when I need them. But the first challenge that I had, the first creative challenge, which again, I wanted to use that random pull was what do I call this thing? I didn't like calling it the Rolodex of ideas or the, sure. or the indirect directions. I'm like, I need a better name, but what is it? So I, I was stuck. So I used my own Rolodex and the thing that I pulled was find a fresh metaphor. Hmm. And so I was like, okay. So I like pulled out the card, stuck it on my bulletin board. And then I was at the Met and I saw this ink stand of Apollo. It was this it's super elaborate yeah. and it's covered. It's got all these little cubbies and it's covered with muses and poets and gods. And then I thought, muse machine. Ooh, That's the name sure. of my Rolodex of ideas is the muse machine because it's like a gen an idea generator. Wow. And I was so excited. But that's the thing is I think there's this, you, and also when you pick something at random, it feels like the universe is some, you're like somehow participating with destiny or, or divine providence. Yeah. And so it's very attractive to, and then it's your creativity that somehow, because we all need something, it's like the sonnet form, you need something to work with. And so it gives you that idea. The constraints are yes. actually- 100%. Uh, yeah, yeah. Free. Yes, yes. It, gives you, it gives you a place, yeah. Oh, good, well, I'll read that. I heard yeah. his, I've heard him interviewed, yeah. um, but I'm psyched to read it. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I was thinking when I was reading your silence chapter, I was thinking of John Cage. Oh, the, well, yes, he's the, he is Mr. Silence. Yes. Yeah, Mr. Silence, but also he used that, whatever that- Randomness, the yeah. The randomness thing, when he, yeah. would, he, he, he would use that to produce art or to make artistic yes. decisions. In the end, randomness is very limited artistically, I think. It's something, it's, it's a tool, but I think you, it runs out. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Have you, speaking of silence- um, You can be one John Cage. Yes, and also John Cage is very interesting. Right. 
who's listening to him right now. Mm. Everybody you know I mean? talks about him yes. though. Every, he's like, yes. yeah, it's incredibly, yeah, it's very compelling. Yes, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, he, he exists kind of as the exception that proves some rules. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and, he makes a point, but then you're not interested in seeing person after person after person making the point that, yes. or like random theater. It's just like, you know, I don't yeah. know. It's, yes. Um, but have you have you been to that church in Helsinki, the Church of Silence? No. In in like whatever the main square in Helsinki is, you walk in and it's this non-denominational church and it was designed, I don't know if it was inspired by the John Cage thing, but it, uh, I've been twice, but it, it, it was just designed, everything was designed to create and foster silence. And mm. you're not allowed to talk in there. Mm. And there's nothing on the walls. Oh my gosh, I'm going to make experience. a pilgrimage. Yeah, it's incredible. I have never heard of this. Yes. I love silence. I can't believe, it's called the, the Church of Silence? I, if you just search Church of Silence, Helsinki, Helsinki okay. whatever, whatever yeah. the crazy Finnish name is. I've been wanting is. a reason to go to Helsinki and now yes. I have it. Excellent. Oh, I would love to. That's one of the things I love about the five senses is it's like a reason to go on all these adventures. It's like, sure. I've never done a sound bath. Why don't I do a sound bath? Uh, yes. You know, a sensory deprivation chamber. Oh yeah, yes. I did that. I found it boring. I have to say, it was not. Did you fall asleep? No, I fell asleep in one way. I found it was. I did not find it transformative. Interesting. Tried cryotherapy. Yeah. Um, yeah you did ayahuasca. Like, I did ayahuasca. Yeah, I heard about that. Big bust. Did not work for me. Yeah. That was a big disappointment. It was a great adventure. And talk about pushing yourself. Like, if you knew me, yeah. you like you, you would you would be very surprised that I had tried ayahuasca. Yeah. Um, so it was something where I was pushing the boundaries of my like my mm -hmm. natural behaviors. Yes, yes, yes. And it was a huge adventure. It was like a whole thing. But as a- Did you get more out of that than the doing it? Oh, 100% because yeah. I got nothing out of the doing it. As like a five senses, sure. Um, you know, heightened senses. Could I experience the universe in this like, you know, like way that I couldn't ordinarily get to on my own? Um, which I was very excited about. Right. Um, but it was also a reason to do it. It wouldn't have occurred to me, except I was like, ooh, five senses adventure. Let's do something actually psychedelic. This should, this right. should be amazing. Um, but I just threw up three times and fell asleep. And then it was, and then nothing happened. And then I was just myself, my, just normal. So nothing, but it was, it was a whole pro, it was a whole thing. Do you think that's just uniquely you or do you think the whole thing is overrated? Oh no, I think it was uniquely me. I think oh. I, I think I just got it out of my system so fast mm. and it was all happening very, very late at night. I'm a real morning person. <laughs> and so I think that my body was like, you know what? It's time to <laughs> shut this down. Why are we awake so late? Like, let's just get rid of this stuff. Um, and and some of the people I was with, a lot of the people didn't, they they didn't have that problem. And so maybe, maybe that's why their experiences were more intense, so. That's interesting. But it, that's what they say about ayahuasca. Like, it's not predictable. That's part of why it's not, somebody was saying to me, that's why it's not addictive. Because for things to be addictive, they, you have to know what, what to expect. And even the people I was with, Everybody had wildly different experiences. So my, well, mine was a bust. I've been joking that you know it works because they have to do it a lot of times. Mm. Ah. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, you know what I mean? They're like, yeah. it was transformative. It changed everything. Uh. And that's why I do it all the time. Oh, interesting. You know what I mean? Okay. Like, it so, sounds like you're describing basically every drug to me. Um, I don't know anybody who's done it a bunch of, well, I guess I know a few people who have done it a bunch of times, but they do everything. Just move to Austin. Right. Okay, ever, all right, ever, okay, yeah. Well, shaman. I run with a very square crowd. So as a former lawyer, <laughs> no, um, uh, yeah, yeah. So I love the idea though, that like the senses are both to be explored and followed and then the tension of like, also don't trust them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you have to remember that what you are experiencing is very much affected by your genetics, your upbringing, your culture, your expectations, the context. Um, if you tell people, oh, you're smelling Parmesan, they'll be like, oh, this smells good. If you say, oh, this is vomit, they'll say, oh, it smells terrible. Right. Or my daughter, um, I brought home a paper white narcissus, you know, and they have that very particular smell. And I said to her, oh, I love the smell of paper white narcissus. And she's like, oh, I didn't know they had a smell. So she leaned in and took a big sniff. And she's like, oh, I, I hate that smell. I thought we had like a dead mouse. I was really worried about that. And then once she knew it was a flower and not a dead mouse, she was like, I don't mind the smell. She doesn't love yeah. the smell. But when she thought it was, when her mind was supplying this like very dark image, she really disliked it. And then when she thought it's a, like a holiday flower, 
Well, that's um, a, become much less noxious. That's a good example, like the way you can be primed. Yes. So it's like if someone says a high number, you're anchored oh, yeah, on the prime number. Or, yeah, or, some, or this is an expensive wine, or yes. this is ecologically friendly coffee. People will rate it higher if they value the environment. Yes. Or they'll take a fast food restaurant and put the food inside yeah. a regular restaurant and people are like, this is amazing. Yeah, right. And yeah. it's like, no, this is McDonald's and right. you would have looked down on it under ordinary circumstances. Yeah, we're so much of, a, of it is what we expect. Um, or well, a flower no, well, and a weed. Talk about marketing. Yeah. It's um, you know if something doesn't doesn't sell well, double the price and sell it, and it will often sell better. No, or ban it. No, no, no garden, no no weed. You right. know, um, or ban it. Oh, 100. <laughs> trying to make. Well, I want to write a book of aphorisms, and one of my aphorisms is: if you try to hide something or make it secret, yes. it unfailingly makes it more interesting. Interesting. Yes, sure. When when people say you shouldn't be able to have it, people go, let me let me check on that. Let me check it out. Yeah. Or like there's the famous story where Barbara Streisand, they were doing a coastal survey and and so there were all these aerial photographs of like every all everything along the coast. And her lawyers found out that you could see her house. So yeah. they like wanted them yeah, to the take it down. Effect. Yes. Right. The Streisand effect. Yeah. And so before the the lawsuit, like six people had seen yes. it, including her lawyers. And then after the lawsuit, like 2 million people have seen it because everybody's like, ooh, what is it that Barbara Streisand doesn't want us to see? Or gun control in California is mostly the result of conservatives reacting to liberal groups like the Black Panthers arming themselves in the 60s and 70s. So mm. when your opponent does something that you would under ordinary, under ordinary circumstances like you perceive it very differently. Mm -hmm. Right, 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 right. No, and then, it's context. And then people think, oh, because yeah. people support this, they don't, they're totally ignoring the causes or the reason right. that thing happened in the first place. Well, it's fascinating how reframing something can completely change it. Like, do I get to do it or do I have to do it? Yeah. It's like, you, you feel very different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no. a Marcus Aurelius thing I love where he goes, you always have the option of having no opinion. Uh, this never a truer word has been said. Or you can, and I, I always think of it as like, what happens if I mind my own business? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Often it's like, yeah, you don't have to weigh in. Yes. Yeah. Well, especially on issues of taste, like just the idea of like, I don't like this. Right. And that is as far as I've thought about this yes. thing. I really don't care that you think that comedian is funny. Right. They probably, if, then it is true. They are funny to you. Right. But it's my, it's my desire to make reality conform to my taste that is the problem. Right. Right. Exactly. I mean, you have people who try to convince you, like, wine is so good. It's, it's like everything, you know, if you've yeah. ever been with somebody who's like a huge wine, and you're just like, I'm just not interested. And they're like, but I could make you interested. I'm like, I, yeah. I mean, it's not, in, nothing is inherently interesting. Nothing is inherently fun. Just because something's fun for you doesn't mean it's fun for me and vice versa. And uh, yeah, you just, again, you have to keep that in mind. All right. I'm, this is my last Mark's really quote, I think. There's two things that I think pertain to your book here. So one, he I think the most beautiful passage in the book is he's walking through this field and he's like commenting on the grain and he's commenting on uh, flecks, of or flecks of foam on a boar's mouth. He talks about the way that bread cracks open in the oven. He just, he's basically just commenting on a bunch of ordinary stuff mm -hmm. as if it is the most beautiful thing mm -hmm. in the world, the way that a poet looks at right, the world. Right. And that's one of the things that I took from, from your book was you were like, I'm just really going to notice stuff. Yes. And when you really notice stuff, you're, it's, it would be unusual if what you noticed was how awful and ugly everything was. Mm. What you noticed is that how wonderful and amazing and unbelievable and majestic yeah. things that you totally yeah. took for granted are. That's true, but it, it does make me more aware of you know clutter and sure. racket and stink, but it's almost like I like it better because it's just part of the range of experience. So even things that I would say I don't like, I still kind of, I don't, I don't begrudge the experience the way I think I used to be just sort of irritated by it. Now I understand it's just part of the range of perception. Yeah, I think it was Which is kind of stoic. I think it was Margaret Thatcher, someone, she was driving in the United States, someone was driving her and she saw like the sprawl of, I don't know, Phoenix, like some yeah. urban, uh, yeah. like, you know, ugly, yeah, 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 ugly yeah, yeah, American yeah, yeah, city. Yeah, yeah, and they yeah. said, look Strip at this malls. sprawl. Yeah. And she said, isn't it beautiful? Yes, right, right, As right. opposed to how yes. it shouldn't be this yes. way. Yes, that's a great example, right? It's jobs, it's building, yeah. it's growth. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think about that with my kids when I see like, a, like I walked into their playroom this morning and it was a disaster. Like right. was, and I go, 
this room is well played in. Yes, right. As opposed to this room should be, should look like kids don't live here. Right, right, right. No, and then back to the thing about not having a judgment. It's like, I feel like with parents, it's like, you're either too boisterous or you're too sluggish yeah. or you're too bold or you're too timid or you're yeah. too bookish or you're not bookish enough. It's just like, it is what, what it is. Yeah, yeah yes. you get what you get and you don't get upset. Yeah, well, I think sometimes people want this like impossible mix in, in their children. Yeah, whereas acceptance is probably a happier, healthier. Well, and the, the same thing as a bug and a feature, yes. you know, so. Yeah, um, or, you know, your dishes, you got a, a sink full of dirty dishes. It's like, is this a chore or is this the tax you pay on the dinner that you just right. had together? Right, right, like right. Like how, right, how right. are you it's choosing to see It's a natural consequence. Yes, 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 yes. So the other Marcus thing, he's he's sitting at like, you know, probably emperor's table. It's some huge table like this and it's piled with all these, you yeah. know, like luxuries. And you were talking about wine and he says, you know, like, it's all rotten grapes. Mm. And he's like, this is a dead yes. pig. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah, a yeah. bloated Ooh, stuffed so fish. so the opposite. Just seeing how ugly yes. everything is. Right. And then you're like, I don't care that it's the most expensive wine in the world. It's this, you know? Like, right. That, to, he, I think he, he's saying that you strip things of the legend that encrust them. Like, mm-hmm. we, just, we just had this tour of the White House. And you're like, this is like an office. Yeah, like, it's very shabby <laughs> yes. and small. Yes, it, it, it really, it's very surprising how small it is, right? Yeah, and then also it's like, do you know how many dumb idiots have worked here? Like, like they, you know, like on the one hand, you can see and like, this is the seat of power of the modern world. And this is where Kennedy stared down the Soviets and the missile crisis. And then you're like, also, this is where was it Harding had an affair in the closet? And, you know, this is where they right. they plotted the segregation of the federal, uh, you know, the <laughs> the, in right. federal, the federal office. Like, you can see, I think the idea is if you see them for the dinginess or yeah. the contradiction, like, that also helps you not be so intimidated right. or blinded right. to the marketing right. that goes along with it. So I guess the stoic perspective would be to just try to understand that both things can be true at the same time or yes. that you don't to have do to judge. One one you don't have to go other. in there and say, this is amazing or this is terrible. You can just say, this is what it is and how do I try to truly take it in? Yes. And and yeah, with sort of a it's calm like when you're, and... When you're depressed, you should look for the wonderful side of it. And then when you're mm. high on your own supply, mm-hmm. you should look to ratchet it down a little bit mm-hmm. with the other... Now, is it true, or is this just like urban myth that in the uh, in they when the emperors would parade go on their triumphant parade, somebody would say, "Remember, you must die." Or, yeah, I yeah. think uh, Epictetus talks about it. Yeah, and he worked in Nero's court, so I mean, maybe it was might have been a one-time thing. Not yeah, like or every it was day. a legend even then. Right. Yes. But after a certain point, it's true. You know, right, like, right, right. To, it, how, how long are we gonna? Right. Right. Go back before it's like the it's true. true. It's true whether it's factual. I guess it's it's very powerful. Yes, yes, and and it's interesting to think that they they mean that in a couple senses. Like so, memento mori is like all humans are mortal. Yeah, but I if you think about it in the context of the slave whispering in the emperor's ear at their moment of greatest accomplishment. I think they're trying to say you're still a human. It's not right. about mortality per se. Right. It's that you're not special. You're right. not like you're still a human being. You're not a god. Right. You're there. We're literally telling you you're a god, <coughs> and then we're also telling, we're reminding you that you're right. not a god. Right. Right. At your moment, moment of triumph. Yes. Yeah. Um, how much time do we have left, Alton? Or we good? Um, what have we done? We did like ten minutes in the studio. Yeah. Thirty-nine here. Oh, we can keep going. And what time's your thing at? One forty-five. Uh, yeah, so I need to like be set yeah, up. Yeah, of course. And, like, yeah, yeah. yeah so, well, let's go like another like. Tw- let me see what else we got. Uh, so you're not a music good. person. Well, what I realize is I'm a song lover, not a music lover. So I like individual songs that I feel very passionate about and love, but I don't like. I won't listen to everything by an artist or a whole genre or listen to suggested playlists or. Rare, I almost never go to concerts because I just like the one song. Why would right. I? Right. Yeah. I'm. I, I. I. think that's an interesting distinction. I am a song person too. I tend mm. to listen to the same songs on repeat. Like yes. when I'm writing, yeah. I need to get into an emotional place. That means like picking a song and running it in a cycle. You know, I. One of the things that was interesting to me is what kind of auditory surroundings help people to f- be focused and productive. And it's, it seems between silence, 
busy hum, which is like coffee shop. Yeah, Malcolm white Gladwell noise. deliberately writes in coffee shops, which yeah, seems no, like a the lot worst of, no, a lot place of people, in the world. A lot of people love yeah. that, like air, air, airports, um, uh, music with words, music without words, and then like music on repeat. And it's interesting, like this idea of the loop. Yeah, I there is a whole subgenre of people who have the loop, and it's just bonkers to me. What do you think that is? I don't know, but it's really like I talked to somebody where she said she would li if she was working with words, she wanted music without lyrics, and if she was working with numbers, she wanted music mm. with lyrics. So I think I think part of it is just knowing yourself and what like, I love silence. But I will take busy hum, but I don't like, uh, I would never, never, never work to music. And in mm. fact, I was on the plane um, and they like had music playing like while people were, were getting seated. And I just was like, oh, I just want to turn it off. I want to read my book and I don't want to right. have this music playing. Um, and, but it's very, and you see like worth an open office plan or if you get a boss, he's like, oh, I read research saying that jazz makes people creative. It's like, mm, not everybody, because you want to listen to the same song over and you want to pick that song right. that works for you. And, um, and then forever do you associate a song with a book project where you're, does it, does it, does it immediately take you back? It hits me more. Um, I listen to music usually when I'm reading. And so like I'm cycling you do. through songs. Yeah. You and do. so See, like, I can't do that. Every once in a while, the song and the book will line up so perfectly that then that book or that song is indelibly right. associated yes. with the civil war right. or this thing. Right. And then, and then I also tend to, eat while I'm reading, like I uh, do it during meals. Yeah. So like, also I crack open the the book and I'm like, oh, that's what I was doing. Right. Clearly right. an Italian restaurant. Right, know? right. You could do an interesting, like, uh, because one of the things I do in the book is like I do a taste timeline yeah. where I went back. It might be interesting for you to do like a reading music timeline where you like track those associations. It might yes. be the kind of thing where it might take a while for those memories to come back, but over time, they, they they would come to your mind. And it would be a really interesting chronology of your own yeah. preferences and interests and how they matched up. I bet. Well, it, and then in the future, it probably would help you remember that better. I've done a playlist, like on pre, if you pre-order some of my books, I'll give you the playlist mm -hmm. of the songs yes, I listened right. to the yeah, yeah, most yeah, yeah. while I was writing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I, you know, they're usually like they're the association exists only in my exactly. you would never guess yeah. they're yeah. not they don't seem like they're related well in, some it, way. It, in the book i read about writing doing my audio apothecary for yeah. all the books that would all the songs that would cure the blues and i put it on spotify and since people have seen it like they keep being like i can't believe you didn't include this song and i'm right. like there's a bazillion songs you know i picked my songs but people are like i can't believe you left this one out because yeah, yeah. everybody has their own list and they but again it's like it's you are the one making the choices. There's no objective. Well, of course, this song must be included because everybody's, you right. know, your playlist for your book, like no one else could come up with that. Of course. Because it's so right. individual, it's so idiosyncratic. That's part of what's fun. I am jealous of music though, in the sense that like what a musician can do in five seconds, you know, even, even me at my absolute best, like the height of my powers, I'm the most locked in, most... I feel like would take me 20 pages in the sense of like striking the mood, conveying mm. like the emotion in music is see, so. I don't, I don't like the imprecision of visual arts or music okay. because I can't with reading, like I can't control what you think, but I can tell you exactly what I am trying to communicate. Sure. Much more. Let me tell you what I mean. Let me yeah. like, yeah. And I, and so, you know, I, I, I think mm. that, that to me is very satisfying. I get what you mean, like in terms of, of like conjuring. Yes. But I don't know. I guess what I'm saying but is that's it's like- that's partly I don't value music that much. one of the best prose writers of all yeah. time. Like let's say we took uh, Fitzgerald okay. or something. right. And then we were somehow able to translate what they were doing to some even, like we had a musician and we had Fitzgerald and we made oh. them do the same thing and yes. we're like, who's better? I see. Or, or we're, I, I feel like a, a mediocre uh, musician could reach the same emotional heights that it would require the absolute master of this other profession to do, if that makes sense. I get it. Yes, yes, it's, yes, yes, it's like yes. one has an like, incredible even like the tailwind. Music, the music playing in a commercial yes. is like tearjerker right yes. away. And you're like, you're like, it would, yeah. A movie yeah, right, score right, sure. compared to what the screenwriter had to do on yeah. the page to get you to feel that right. way to what the author had to get you to feel that way in a book. Right. It's like, you know, it's yeah. like pages of prose, a handful of bits of dialogue 
And then it's like three notes. Right, 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 right. It's like right, spinal I tap. Get it. I think yeah, a, I get it. E minor is the yeah, saddest yeah, 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 key. It's like that already did most of the work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you're just, you're just, it's like you just have. So it, the, of the neglected sense, you know, I yes. have this quiz, what's yeah. your neglected sense? So my most neglected sense is taste, but my second most neglected sense is hearing. And I think I'm just not, yes. I'm just not oriented for hearing. And so I don't look to it for pleasure or interest or engagement or curiosity particularly. And so, uh, so it's interesting. Like I have it would never occur to me to think that. Yeah. Um, but for somebody who likes music more, then that's that's something that you you know you would you'd have a thought like that because you're more oriented to to sound and music and hearing. But you talked to your podcast editor in the book. I thought that was interesting, and well, they're just like, no, I could, they they're noticing all these things that you're like, what? Yeah, well, because in, in my for my podcast, every week I tell like a little story, a little mm -hmm. teaching story. You love a teaching story. Yeah. I love a teaching story. So I tell like a little teaching story. I don't call them that because that sounds so boring. But there's a Greek word for it. It's called. Ooh. Crazia or something like Ooh. this. And it means like an anecdote yes. that teaches a lesson. That is what I do. I'm going to yes. look that up. Okay. Yeah, I'll, we'll, I'll find yeah, it. We'll, yes. we'll, we'll do that. Okay. I did not know that. Um, right. So that's what these are. Um, and so what, so, and he records them. Yes. And so he's, so, and a lot of them involve music, like the farmer and the cowman from yeah. Oklahoma, which is like, oh my gosh, the thoughts that yeah. I have around that song. Um, and, and so he'd heard me tell these like very heartfelt stories. Um, related to songs. And so he could say to me, you do have strong emotions related mm. to songs. You know, I don't understand why you're saying this about yourself. And it just, it, it allowed me to see myself in a completely different way. I'm a song lover, not a music lover. Well, and, and also though, like if you're not an audio person, there's all these things that as you're operating in say an audio medium, like we were in one room, now we're yeah. in another room as yeah. we're recording this, this is all yeah. explained in the intro. But like you and I would probably not perceive any difference or any yes, dropping. Yeah, whereas yeah, some people are going to yeah. be like, I like the first 10 minutes yeah, and then yeah, I had to stop. Yeah, yeah, or, yes. or just yeah. all these different, like, I, I don't like the mic that you're using yeah. or I don't like how you pronounce the these plosives. words. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Or people yeah. email me, I don't like how much you say the word like. And being from, a, being from California, that oh, never, that's just sure. how I exist. So that right. would never... Right. Not only would it never bother me, but I also don't understand the kind of person that would write in to right. tell the person that it bothers them. But right. well, as I've come to realize is that like, oh, this is like, they're wearing like a very scratchy sweater. Like yeah. that's what that is for them. And mm -hmm. they can't, they're overwhelmed by the sensation that this is bringing up mm -hmm. and it's creating literally zero sensation in me. Well, exactly. And to your point about we see what we look for that yeah. our perceptions can change. If somebody says, pay attention, you'll start to be overwhelmed yeah. by it. Whereas yeah. before you might not have noticed it at all. Yes. Um, yeah, and if people want to play with this, I encourage everybody to run and watch the Monkey Business Illusion on YouTube. This is and, where you don't notice what's happening. Well, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, I won't yeah. It. Yes. Something yes. You're, you're told to count how something about basketballs. Yeah, yes. if you don't know this, go check it out, Monkey Business Illusion, and it will, it's bonkers. Um, There's even a version that if you know if you know the illusion, there's one where it outfoxes you, but I don't, I can't get into that without spoiling it. As we wrap up, I wanted to talk to you because I read Evan Thomas's biography of your old boss. Mm -hmm. Have you yeah. read that book? I did not read it. I, 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 that she wasn't a person. I talked that, to him for it though. Oh really? Yeah. She yeah. wasn't a person that I was primed to be particularly excited or interested in. Mm -hmm. And I found his biography of Sandra Day O'Connor just like totally riveting. Mm-hmm. Um, she's an icon two thing or a couple things that connected with your book is one he tells this story where um, she like you know she leaves her office one day she makes like a bunch of her clerks come with her maybe this was you ah. but um, she's she starts collecting uh, cicadas uh, like yeah. you know every 15 years or whatever they appear yes. and she's like um, she's picking them up and she's like put these in this box and then she makes her clerk mail it uh, back home to Arizona and they're like what are you doing and she was like um my grandkids have never seen this before. Yeah. And she was like, and I want them to be curious about nature and the world. And, and she said this great line that I think about, she said, because if you're not curious, you're not smart. Mm -hmm. That's so true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very Justice O'Connor. That's yes. exactly. I asked her after I wrote The Happiness Project, I said to her, well, what do you think the secret to happiness is, yeah. Justice? And without a pause, she said, work worth doing. Ooh. And the more I've thought about the answer, the, that answer, the better I think it is. Because she doesn't say work for pay. Right. Or work for power right. or work for influence. It's work worth doing. Yes. And that's something that only you can decide. But I think it's a really, but like it's, if you don't have work worth doing, 
it's hard to be happy. Yeah, well, it's like if you don't have a reason to get out of bed in the morning, mm -hmm. it's hard to get out of bed mm -hmm. in the morning. Mm -hmm. The other one I, I liked is um, he, one of the clerks is, I think it's a female clerk, was saying that um, uh, what she always admired about her was that she never said sorry before she said no. Mm -hmm. So she was like, hey, do you want to come talk at this? Do you want to come deliver this commencement address? She would just say no, not oh, sorry, I can't. Yeah. Being a Supreme Court justice is a very special thing. Sure, sure. Um, yes, uh, that, yes, that you, you do not... Um, you do not apologize for what you do and don't want to do. But I think sure. this clerk was saying that from the perspective, especially maybe earlier on, of a woman mm. not being a people pleaser in mm. the sense of like, mm. I just, I don't want to hurt anyone's mm. feelings. So no. I agree yes. to do a bunch of stuff no. that I don't want to do. I think no. we all struggle with that. Yeah. I love the idea yeah. of uh, no being a complete sentence. Yeah. Or I don't want to. Yeah. No, I know some funny stories uh, related <laughs> to that that I will not tell. But um, but yes, that was that is very characteristic of Justice O'Connor. Absolutely, yeah, very, um, very clear on what she did and did not want. Yes. In, in the most in the most kind of straightforward and and pleasant way. She was a she was a very gregarious and kind person, but very clear on what she did and didn't want. I feel like that's something we could all be better at, though, right? It's like yeah. we. Like we don't want to say no to one person, mm -hmm. even though that inherently means saying no to other people, if not ourselves. No, but and that's a great. Uh, this gets into the four <laughs> tendencies personality yes. profile, which we won't even get into. But if you want to know about that, yeah. um, my four tendencies book. But often for people who have trouble saying no, what you what the way to help them is to say, remember to say yes to one person. You have to say no to somebody else. If yes. I say yes to my team and work late, I have to say no to my family. And I've yes. we've talked about how I'm going to be home by six thirty. And, or like, if I turn down this opportunity, someone else has a chance to get up and speak at that convention yeah. or somebody oh, else sure. can be on that, that faculty advising committee. And for me, I don't want to do it. And for somebody else, it could be like a, a, a life-changing, career-changing opportunity. If I, if, if I say no, then I can say yes to something else or somebody else gets to say yes. And that's for certain people, that's a very, very helpful thing to remember to help them have that kind of outer accountability for what they need to, 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 uh, Assert that. And the sort of invisible graveyard of projects you mm -hmm. could have finished yeah, or done. Yeah, yeah. But I like that phrase. Yes. <laughs> I like that phrase, yeah. Uh, like when the pandemic happened and suddenly I wasn't traveling, uh -huh. I wasn't doing me. Like I was like, oh, this is the level that I could be operating at uh -huh. creatively. Uh -huh. Like the opportunity costs are usually hidden, hidden. from us. Yes. Yes. Ooh, opportunity cost is, I remember learning that idea in law school yeah. and being like, this explains so much. <laughs> yes. Like, it's a really important idea to understand. Everything has an opportunity cost. I think we're very, very bad at understanding uh, that. Absolutely. Yeah. Ooh, that should be your next book. <laughs> Stoics look at opportunity cost. Well, Seneca's favorite or most famous quote is about how if somebody stole your money or encroached on your property, you would be immediately aghast, yeah. but you will let people impose on your time yes. without question, even though that's the only uh, irreplaceable, non-renewable resource. And we think about this for ourselves. Like, why are we, I mean, you never waste time because you're always doing something with sure. time, but you often will, I, I think often people feel, uh, and that's one of the funny things I found about for people who are too attracted to their phones, Yes, turn your phone to grayscale. Yes. It's so much harder to use because just the, the site that you sure. need to use your phone is so cumbersome that it's much easier to put it down because that is one thing where over and over you hear people say, there's better uses for my time than doom scrolling sure. or, you know, or just going through the news feed or whatever. Um, and so make it harder to use and then it's less appealing. And then that, or I've heard of people putting things on their, their home screen, like read, <laughs> yes. you know, to remind you so sure. that a device reminds you, this isn't how you want to be. I don't want to steal my own time. Yes. I don't want to waste my own yeah, time. Yeah, well, we're, we're willing to steal an unlimited amount of times from ourselves or our sort of future potential. Yeah. Whereas we're pretty, we're better at protecting other people's time for some. I don't want to waste your time, but mm -hmm. I'll waste my time. Mm -hmm. You know, scrolling on this thing. Right, right. So it's all about yeah. It, it's all about this self awareness. I I have Instagram is the only social network I I have like the password to, mm -hmm. um, but it's on my wife's phone. And so it's like, like you could, I yeah. just there's just like what, having one little extra step or just yes. it's not literally in my pocket. 
inherently limits the amount yeah. of time I can spend on the thing. And then not not um, not having access to Twitter has been the best one over the years. Mm -hmm because I've never been on there and been like, I'm glad, that was mm -hmm. good. That was better for me. Well, so I wrote a book about habits called Better Than Before, yeah. about the 21 strategies of how to change habits. And one of the most universally useful ones is the strategy of inconvenience, because yes. to like a hilarious degree, yeah. we won't do something if it's even slightly, there's hilarious research about with a salad bar that if you if people have to use tongs instead of a spoon, they take a lot less food because they just can't be bothered to use the tongs. So the the least bit of inconvenience and having to go to your wife and be like, hey, yeah. can I look in your phone? Your that's phone. a pretty Why? that's a yeah, pretty yeah. major <laughs> inconvenience. Um, that's a great. That's always like if there's something you don't want to do, make it inconvenient. If you want yourself to do it, make it convenient. And this really this really really works. When the feedback loop there is, then you also realize that you didn't miss it, which I'm sure you kind of found on the sugar stuff. It's like you cut oh, it out. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Well, and it's with the sugar thing, it's even kind of more magical because one of the things I couldn't understand is like, everybody's always like, oh, there are all these food cues. How are yeah. you not distracted by food cues? And I'm like, why am I not distracted by food cues? What's a cues? food cue? Oh, like you see an image, you mm. smell, and sure. you know, insomnia sure. cookies, you're walking through an airport and it's Auntie yeah. Anne's, whatever. Ooh, smells. Uh, smell is a cue. You know that's a company that does that? Oh, 100%. Yeah. yeah. The, the same because company that does elevator music owns the company that pipes in smells at all of those restaurants. Well, and it's it's the baking and, yeah. yeah. It's like the sounds uh, in the right. movie. It's not actually right. a horse on right. cobblestones. Right, 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 it's a person right, right, right. Like who has a better shells. version of right. making that right. sound. Yeah. Right, and so, um, but, you know, there's all these, you know, anywhere you go, you see images, yeah. whatever. Um, so these are food, food cues. And I thought, well, why am I not distracted by yeah. them? But then like doing the research for Life in Five Senses, I realized it's because this is this information isn't useful to me. Mm. My brain is moving it into the background. Right. So when I had my active sweet tooth and I was eating sugar, if there was like a plate of cookies in the middle of a conference room, sure. I mean, all I could see and think about was, oh my gosh, right. one cookie, two cookie, three cookies. Now it's my birthday, it's raining, I deserve it tomorrow. Yeah. But now it's like I hardly even notice them because I don't eat them. So it's just, they just fade away. It's just like they're just like a pile of pens. It's like, do I need a pen? I, and and so I think often when we're trying to do behavior change, it, it's reinforcing in ways that we don't necessarily anticipate because part of what it is is we begin to adjust, right? Our ex, you know, and and um, and maybe like we really get into reading, and so we start a book, and now we're like, oh my, this book is so good. I want right. to keep reading, you know, hour after hour. But you have to read for ten minutes before you realize how much you love the book. And, um, you know, so a lot of times these things will, uh, you can have a virtuous cycle or an, or, a, or an unvirtuous cycle, depending on what's going on. Well, and the other ver part of the virtuous slash unvirtuous cycle there is then you have the thing that you cut out of your diet. Let's say you cut out bread mm -hmm. and then you go have regular pizza, which maybe you had once a week previously. And then you just feel terrible mm -hmm. because your body's not used to having that thing. Mm -hmm. And you go, oh, I was just used to this feeling. I mm -hmm. had the acquired, like we talked about acquired taste. You had the acquired right. taste and you go, this is why I don't do that. Right, right, <laughs> Like right. you realize that, like you said, sugar is a toxin, but you're used to it. So it doesn't feel toxic. Right. And then you get some distance from it and it becomes clear mm -hmm. why you should continue to avoid mm -hmm. it. Right. Or you right. hopelessly relapse. Right, and, uh, right. Well, yeah. Have to start you the cycle uh, <laughs> over again. Yeah, no, you definitely appreciate it more, or you you uh, you experience it more intensely when it's rarer. Yes. Well, I loved the book, and I'm glad that uh, it's not rare that you publish a book. I feel like you are you are the exact right amount of prolific. Oh, good. Well, thank you. You're prolific you're yourself. We both we both like to write. But I might be the raw. I might be slightly too. Like I, I, you don't do a book. You're like every two two and a half years. Yeah. It's like yeah. just enough. Yeah. I'm like it's been a while. Yeah, yeah, good. Well, I'm so happy to hear you say that. Um, yeah, it's exciting to have but not another like, book out in the world. To yeah, 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 you know? yeah. What's she been up to? Yeah, yeah. No, it's fun. Um, yeah. Well, it's so fun to get the chance to talk to you. Yeah. Thanks.